welcome to Manch Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And look where we are. Yay! We're in the studio. Um, ironically, last week when Carla and I taped via Zoom, apparently I never hit record properly. So we weren't, we had a really nice conversation amongst the two of us, but only amongst the two of us. We, we did. And, and we missed you guys. And we yep. missed the studio. Yep. And we missed our ha happy helper producer back there. So it's, yeah. it's great to be back here. And it's great to see that maybe life is starting yeah. to return to normal. I think it's creeping there. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's some things that I still can't figure out why. I, I still am very highly annoyed with why, don't, I don't want to spend the show talking about, but why city offices still are closed. Um, filing period starts tomorrow morning um, here in New Hampshire for people running for office. And um, I just got a clarification from the city clerk's office, which is usually awesome. I have like nothing to gripe about. They're like probably the one of the most efficient offices in the city. Um, but they're only going to... Unless you're a libertarian recount uh, candidate. Right, no, no. <laughs> but recount, okay. I mean, sure. Um, but they, um, they're only going to be open on the 12th for in-person filing. Everybody else has to do it via the Dropbox. And I was kind of a little disappointed because I don't understand how I can go to Walmart and all these things. But when Dan went to register his motorcycle, we had to go like three different times and drop stuff off and pick stuff up and all this craziness. I mean, and it's I also don't... amazing because, you know, no one's gotten furloughed. No one's well, been cut. You know, no one's, I mean. no one's time has been cut. So I almost feel like there is this opportunity that services should have been peak, right. peak service well, and should have been like, served to us online. You know, I got a, I got a parking ticket I last week. I am very, very bitter about it. And I, I told them, I mean, I appeal. They'll they're, probably they're gonna, cancel it. To no, they won't. Oh, they won't. I, I already heard from oh. them. So I, you know, so I, I mean, I just said I wasn't going to pay it because I was deemed non-essential. And as a non-essential, I don't see why I can be both essential to pay stuff to keep people not providing us with services and also be essential to pay, I you know, know like I it know. just, I, I well, can't. And I mean, and even at now, we're at the point in this, you know, saga, Madness. right? Where, you know, what business at this point, now I'm not saying all businesses are open, but at this point, almost all businesses have the ability to open in some well, form. I mean, they might be, it might be convoluted or whatever, but I'm saying if all those businesses well, they have open, ways how is to this? open, they don't necessarily have ways to make a no, profit. I agree, but I'm saying- Because part of the problem with too much statism, with too big government, with people actually telling you now by degree how to wash your know, hands in the state that, um, you know that 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 they they can't make money, so it doesn't help to really say, well, you know, you can be open because if you can't actually pay your employees or pay your rent or pay any of the things, then you're not really open. Right. You're just hurt in a new and different way. And I, and you know, I I, mean, I agree with you. I'm just saying that like. At this point, how is it that city offices, okay, we can go back and say maybe they were closed because they were, you know, okay. But now with things opening, how come government isn't opening? And it's not just Manchester. I hear this from all the t different town clerks and whatever. Secretary of State's office is taking um, filings outside of the building, which I guess is okay, okay whatever. It just seems a little odd. Anyways. So, uh, so when I go to sign up uh, to be run outside. against Canoe, you know, Canoe Lou. Canoe Lou, Lou, who also was uh, the person responsible, I believe, for writing all yeah. this emergency legislation that has uh, devastated so much of Granite Staters' lives over the past yep. three months. Um, so you have. I brought something. some fun stuff because, you know, <laughs> if you haven't noticed, um, there's a little upheaval in our country. You don't say. Um, for those of you who've been asleep for a week, maybe, um, in Minneapolis last week, a gentleman was killed by a police officer. I watched the video. Um, he was suffocated. Yeah, he was murdered. It, it was. That police officer has been charged. The three police officers that stood by and watched it. My dad, helped. only reason they got charged is because someone was filming it so right. that we could prove what right. actually happened um, so that there wasn't just one version. But going back forward from that, I have, I, 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 it's hard because obviously I'm not black, but I took it the same way you had taken it. I saw it as 
that police officer is out of control and should not be doing that. I did not take it as, look at that white police officer killing that black man. Because in that, it, it, I don't think the problem lies in necessarily 100% to do with the color of our skin. Granted, I am not black, so I cannot put myself in the situation of knowing what it feels like day in and day out to be a black person living in our country. But I think depending on where you live and whatnot, um, I mean, I can tell you in 2017 in New Hampshire, 25% of all people who were shot and killed in the state were shot and killed by police officers. 25% right. of homicides in 2017 were police right. officers killing people. And that should stop everyone, and we and should they analyze that. Most, I think, I believe all of the people in that case were white. That's what I was going to so, say. So it's, but we don't. Those are stories that are told in a different way when it is a white police officer killing a black person or at any time a white person kills a black person that becomes the that becomes the core of the story the difference between the skin color well i think what's starting to happen is that people are acknowledging and seeing that we have created a systemic problem mm. you know there's this beautiful phrase out of a book called um i think it's the rise of the warrior cop um radley balco it's a really interesting oh, yeah, read like it's academic it's well researched their footnotes uh, you know if you really want to open your eyes about yeah. you know this particular issue I, I highly recommend that book but in it they talk about the um the epidemic of isolated incidences, right? So this is something you'll hear across the nation. And before we had social media and before we actually had tools and technology to level the playing field a little bit, of course, you know, now that's being taken away from us under this guise of censorship and all of that, but that's a separate conversation. This epidemic of isolated incidences. So every little town could be like, eh, it's just there's one, there's just just one, one guy, thing. right? But then when you actually start to analyze it nationwide and i remember and i've been working on these issues for a long time but i remember around 2015 i think it was the ferguson case when reporters started going but why aren't there statistics on how many police officers are killing people in the line of duty you know not them getting killed but mm -hmm. actually you know and and the statistics there i believe for last year I think there were 47 officers who died in the line of duty. That uh, number actually includes people who have a heart attack within right, two days right. of, of any kind of incidents or, you know, it's, it's, it's a padded number with all due respect. Um, so it's about 47 to over a thousand yeah. at this stage, right? So I think that there's, there's real anger, there's real mm -hmm. frustration, but there's also an opportunity then to, yeah. to, to maybe- To all shed some light on the problem itself? Well, well, I think everyone at this stage, if you don't know there's a problem, I'm like, wake up. So the question becomes, okay, there is a problem. How do we fix the problem? And so I would say, get rid of qualified immunity. I qualified agree. immunity is something that basically the way to think about it is a get out of jail free card yep. for police officers and state employees where they are held to a lower standard than you and I yep. would be held to. Make sure that the unions aren't corrupt yep. and fire people when they do bad things. Stop protecting well, bad I, actors. I remember when they when the, the day after the day of or the day after this guy had been killed um now i'm d drawing a blank on who wrote it um but somebody oh it was I, it was keith murphy had made a post and he talked about you know all the things wrong and he talked about you know yes there most cops are good i do believe that most i don't believe that all co people who become police officers are doing so because they want to you know be bad cops but the problem is is you, if you have this many you know you have these this handful of bad cops and all this, let's say all the others are good cops, but the problem is, is when the good cops turn a blind eye to the bad cops, that actually makes the good cops bad cops. Well, because you're that. ignoring the problem that is tainting your your entire um, profession. Well, that, and I mean, we know the saying is, uh, you know, a bad apple spoils the bunch, and that is it where it seem. becomes the institutionalized systemic part. And so here in New Hampshire, and yep. I'm sure we'll tie into this, we actually had. We have good news for a change. Yes. 
Somewhat. The oh. New Hampshire Supreme Court did come out last week in two right to know cases where there was this case from the 90s. It's called the Fenneman case. Yep. It was a very bad decision. It's been a bad decision. It's been around for a long time. It has shielded bad actors. And basically what the Fenneman decision said is anything that the state wants to say is a personnel matter, they're just going to you know, you can't throw it have. in that file and then it's exempt from any kind of, you know, open, transparent, responsive, accountable government. And so um, the, the state has relied on that to hide things like, uh, you know, disciplinary reports, um, actual complaints where they brought in auditors to look at either budgets or how many is being spent where there's actually been fraud and malfeasance and like really, really like sketchy, bad, yep. shady, shady stuff. And, you know, they would just put it in the personnel file and, and say it's, it's exempt. So these two decisions, which are not the Lori's nope. List decision, and it's not the Keene case decision, so those should be yep. coming out in the next two weeks, three weeks, I'm hopeful. But these two both said, we are overturning Fenneman, yep. which is a big deal for the Supreme Court well, to do. Well, because they're saying the decision that we made in the past is incorrect. Was, was wrong, right? Because they love the story decus. It's, you know, we, we stick to the precedent, which as a lawyer has always confounded me in some ways because it, I both love it yep, because but it then means you, go, well, you what if have we make to a mistake? be consistent. But then also it takes 30 years yep when they make a mistake to get it reversed. Yeah. So basically in these two cases, what they've said is, they haven't said it's not going to be uh, open immediately, right. right? What the courts have said is we're gonna remand this back down yeah. to the lower courts and then people have to use a balancing act. So they have to go, instead of just saying de facto, it's not, you know, you're, you're not allowed to see it, you're not allowed to know what happened. They're saying, you know, the lower court can now look at this and say, well, clearly there's a public interest right. in knowing uh, that this police officer, one of the cases was the one where that the police officer uh, Shanghai, the, the old lady, and got her entire estate for yes, like yes, $2 yes. million dollars and everything, and there was an internal report. And then they were just like, no, we're just going to hide this. And of course, there was public interest. That was a sort of salacious story. A cop actually well, got fired. And some, you know. somebody was losing money. Who else right? is a victim of this person? So, so, so good news for right to know. Yep. Good news for open, transparent, accountable yep responsive government, those four words, they're all in the you know New Hampshire constitution. And we as the citizens of New Hampshire should insist on it, especially as we move into this like police state. Well, <laughs> so yesterday I um, stumbled across a post and these are things that, you know, this isn't new to me. Um, you know, I, there's always this the story about um, how the sausage is made. And uh, Marshall, it's Co gross. Yeah, Marshall <laughs> Cobley, who was I think uh, Ray Wazorek's chief of staff or something. This is be probably before your time. Marshall Cobley wrote a book about how the sausage is made, um, and you know it's never a pretty process. That's in real life when you watch make actual sausage, and also in political things. Um, but yesterday, Jimmy LaHoo, who w served a term on the Manchester Board of School Committee, so this is somebody who served on a board. Um, and you'll see all the time if you watch these meetings that from time to time, whether it's the aldermen or uh, the school committee, they go into a non-public session. And there are legitimate reasons to go into non-public session. If they're discussing legal strategy, you don't want to be on live TV discussing legal strategy. If you are actually talking about a personnel issue, you know, if you're talking about uh, of course, this is is highly abused. At it this is, stage. but I'm saying there is legitimate reasons why sure. you know you don't want everything to be. Up Except front. that you know, honestly, I I'm not even sure. Other than attorney-client privilege, right? And that should not well, be maybe at negotiation. The maybe contract negotiations because you don't want to play your hand to the union. Maybe, but I don't think that's why they do it. But anyways, no. so Jimmy had firsthand now saw how the sausage is made, and he made this post, and I'm going to read it for the most part because I do find that it's very telling. He said, having had the experience in the political arena, I feel I have a different vantage point in how the sausage is made. If I did not speak up, shame on me. It's time to pull the curtain down on our public officials and their ability to go into non-public sessions. This was my experience. Let's go back to the beginning. The cop that murdered Mr. Floyd has quite the rap sheet. This was not his first incident. 
This begs the question, how the hell was he still on the force? I do not have experience in dealing with police or fire or any other union organized group other than those on the education side. Having seen how the sausage is made on the school side, I can say this. What I have seen is, time and time again, the union protecting those that should not be anywhere near a child or in the classroom. Yes, there are teachers in our system that should not be there, but it only takes the threat of a lawsuit or the city attorney telling us what it would cost to fight the union and the officials fold like a cheap suit. One, because the expense would become public, and two, because they want to maintain the belief that we have all upstanding employees, and three, or worse, burying the cost into line items that has nothing to do with the situation. There are 1,200 some odd teachers in the Manchester school system, and there were a few cases that came before the board in my tenure. That means those few teachers are still teaching. In one case, when we found out the situation, there was not a single board member whose jaw did not drop. But when the rubber hit the road, the board refused to take action, and yes, this still person is still employed in our schools. Should an incident happen with these teachers again, it reflects on the entire teacher occupation, not just the individual, and this is wrong. We have more great teachers than not, but it only takes one to taint the image of all of them. So where did the situation with Mr. Floyd start? Let's look at the rap sheet and see how this officer was able to maintain his badge. And I thought that is really a big part of the problem. The, the thin blue line, and okay, now I'm gonna be labeled as a cop hater because if you say anything bad about any cop, that immediately means you're a cop hater. So, I, first of all, I think we should stop disclaiming that because I feel like that is just pandering to their needs. We are allowed to have an open conversation about the people who serve us in a way where we don't have to say, I'm not criticizing a, <laughs> you doesn't is mean somehow I'm, you know not allowed. And I don't think we should keep doing these disclaimers. I. I, I so, so uh, fine. That's, you know, that's no, I agree. Did you see that? Uh, speaking of the thin blue line, I saw a photo this morning on social media where at a mm. police station they took down the American flag and raised one of those weird Black cop blue, flags that has the thin okay. blue line on it. You see it in New York now. I I have seen it in New Hampshire. Right. I have them deposed on my my transcripts from yep. my law lawsuit um that you know you'll see the insignia and i ask people to think about this how is that different from gang signs well and and, and i dan and i had this conversation and i said and why why does that you know like why you don't see um other professions have a little bumper sticker on their car with a symbol that represents their profession so uh, on the surface, one might say, well, they're just, you know, that's just a pride thing. We're just going to put this little thin blue line sticker on our vehicle to show pride. And I am, I'm, maybe I'm just, go, maybe I'm a skeptic at heart. Um, years ago, I remember people used to buy the, the I support the state trooper st thing. You know, you donate to the Troopers Association and they give you this, this sticker to put on your car. And I was always told as a kid, well, that's because if you have the sticker on your car, you're less likely to get pulled over for speeding. I happen to believe and, you know, prove me wrong that the way, reason the thin blue line stopped just becoming a camaraderie thing and became more of a identity thing is because the police officers put that sticker on their cars and on the spouse's cars and their family's cars so that the police turn a blind eye to them. Well, and that to that... me as a taxpayer and as a citizen is not acceptable because you're either there to enforce the law equally and across <laughs> the board or you're Jeez. not. And, and but, but here's the other thing is that with, um, I, I think that part, I think a big part of the problem and the heart of the problem is, is the training that law enforcement mm -hmm. receives now. You know, when we talk it's about it, I've, militarized. And, and I've done, you know, decades of work on the militarization of police, and I've been warning about this for a long time. And I was really, truly heartened to see a very peaceful march yep. in downtown Manchester yep. with hundreds, you know, yep. a lot of people. Yep. People, uh, a little group split off and went to the police station yep. and, you know, the chief came out and spoke to them. I think all of those yep. things are good, right? Because I think part of that is let's make sure that people are talking to each other. Mm -hmm. But if you are training your officers to perceive the people that they 
claim to serve, although the Supreme Court has said there is no duty for police officers to protect anybody. to protect and serve you, just so that everyone back home knows that. Um, you know, let's not train them to view us as the enemy. Right. You know, we're hiring a lot of veterans. Veterans have been trained to view people as the enemy. Yeah. That's their job if they're going into yeah. a foreign place. They, they're they soldiers of war. But America is not supposed to be a war zone, although we are very fast moving towards yeah. that dynamic, right? So, sorry, so, I did No, no, that's you. fine. Um, so you've got Jimmy LaHue saying that, which is interesting, which ties into something I brought up last week. Oh, I did okay. want to mention, because that, that sort of question Fenomen of... Fenomen would apply. Of, right, well, that, but also this this sort of idea of the, the shifting of the problematic people to different areas. Uh, a lot of our regular viewers will recall that I was horrified by that, that attack on that child last year at Keene High School, yes. right? Where the kid was leaving the bathroom, he's 15 years old, he's in shorts, pink shorts, and like like Bobby Sox kind of, you know, like he just looks like he's like a naughty kid and he's walking out of the bathroom and I guess he was cheeky, whatever, but you know, if a parent had done this, it wouldn't be legal. Uh, and this police officer like dives him, throws him on his neck, throws him on the floor and everything. Nothing happened to the cop. The kid was suspended and the kid who made the video got into trouble too. So that whole dynamic already wrong. But then I went to do some research on that police officer, the resources officer, because we can't say we have cops in the schools, but we do. And he has shot and killed someone in the line of duty. So when you're shuffling people around, the question also begs to be asked, is that the officer, the peace officer, not a peace officer, that you want in the schools? Because based on the face of it, of that video, that was, if it had been a parent, child abuse. If it had been a teacher, I hope they would have gotten fired, but they probably wouldn't probably have. Probably not. Um, you know, so these are the systematic institutionalized problems. And so when we talk about smaller government, accountable government, these are the things that we're trying to fix. There is a serious problem, and if we're not even allowed to talk right. about it without being criticized for being critical, then that's part of the problem as well um yeah last week when in the episode that carla and i were the only ones who got to see um, <laughs> it was great <laughs> and tie -in, i just was like well gee that ties right back into this so there was a um story a couple weeks back maybe a week or so back um talking about covering and apparently the vice Pr maxine mosley who i believe is a teacher who also happens to be the vice president of the manchester education association so that's the union that you know negotiates and organizes uh, the teachers she was caught shopping at bj's during the school hours when she's supposed to be teaching remotely and there was a whole brouhaha over the, it the, the same teachers association for folks following along that uh secretly passed their, mm. their their contract their, at the start of our lockups. Well, and during that contract negotiation, um, there was a big concern about sick and personal time because we have a very bad problem with teachers calling in sick and uh, we have like a crazy high um, out sick rate. But anyway, I mean, almost 50%. It's isn't like some it? crazy yeah, thing, it's, it's it, which very is very bad. disruptive to the mm -hmm. education process. Anyways, the loudest opponent to those to, to reigning in this policy. Um, and it, who said, you know, the data didn't show the problem was this teacher, Maxine Mosley, who happens to be the vice president of the teachers union. She argued that there wasn't a problem. She asserted that if there was one, if there was a problem that the school district should enforce its way out of it. But she admitted that any action taken by the district would likely be grieved by the union. And she also said that any enforcement mechanism would be absolutely useless. So you've got the teachers union saying, well, you know, we have teachers out calling out sick for wrong reasons and everything, but you should just, you know, process your way out of it. And oh, by the way, when you start the process, the union's going to back the teacher and we're going to threaten to sue you. And then you're just going to drop it because look, Jimmy Lahuy says that's exactly what we do. But you know, I also want people to really start to think about, you know, when we talk about personal responsibility and we talk about like doing the right thing and stuff, we can write all the words on paper and you can try yeah. and process things in. You can try and like enforce your way in and out of stuff. But ultimately, you know, people I think need to really start to just take charge of themselves. of themselves. And, and, and that starts, you know, w 
with your health, you everything. know, like with everything. So, you know, when I look at everything that's happened over the past three months, I'm like, this is such a huge opportunity. Imagine we had used all these resources to try and make people healthier, yeah. to really talk about what are you eating? How are you eating? How much sleep are you getting? What shows are you watching? What kind of junk are you putting in your life, you know, right. like all of that stuff, because we're not going to heal the world unless we each heal ourselves. Right. And so if you're one of these peach people, you know, the Karens, right, where, you know, Karen. you're snitching on your neighbors and you're doing all of that. The question is, like, are you doing everything in your life? Like, like I think the saying is, uh, look at your own plate uh, first, yeah. right? Something, look, yeah. Uh, look inward. Definitely look inward before you start pointing fingers. Well, what did they say? If you point your finger at somebody, three of your fingers are pointing, pointing back, back at you. you know? It is true. It's like, I, I find myself, and it's sometimes very hard to explain to those pe to people. I had a conversation with somebody who was complaining about the neighbor putting up an eight-foot fence and people saying, well, you should call the police. And I'm like... It's your neighbor's fence. He's allowed to put up a fence. And it just is interesting when you have this dialogue, people, you know, do have you talked to your neighbor? Did you think maybe reaching over the fence and saying, hey, but look, what's the story? If, when, when people's first response it's to any police. is call the police, we have a serious problem. Right. Let's stop doing that. Talk to your neighbors. Well, find out, out find out how, what the reality is, is before you think that somebody's breaking a law and figure out, understand what the police can and can't do. Well, also because when you do. call the police, the way to look at it is you're calling someone who is licensed to kill. So unless you're willing to kill your neighbor over the fence, don't call the cops because I'm not gonna say, I'm not saying they would kill no, the neighbor. No, that's, but that's the point. That's, that's, the, that's the, the point yes. of the police, so. Um, so on the wrap up here, um, if you're out and about, and I don't know if we'll be showing this today, if we'll get this back from um, the producer and upload it, but um, we'll, it'll be interesting to see if there actually is a second protest in Manchester on South Willow Street tonight. Um, hopefully, if there is, there will not be vandalism and rioting and looting and whatnot. I um, did read. There's supposed to be a peace vigil at hopefully, Stark Park. Hopefully. With um, candles and Providence, just... Rhode Island report had 50 businesses with damage from a riot there last don't, night. Don't damage the businesses. Like they, direct the your <laughs> anger at the right place, which is at the government and not at, you know, Target. Right, Target didn't do it. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, some of the places that they, that are there, I'm seeing pictures of broken windows and stuff. They have signs in the window that say Black Lives Matter, and I think I, I don't, and, I don't know what. And looting, and looting a shoe store, the Asian provocateurs. You know, looting a shoe store does not get the message out that there's a problem with pr police killing people, any people, regardless of how much pigment or is in your skin or not, because that's the way I always like to talk about people, different colors of skin. It's all about pigment. <laughs> I don't know why we look at how much pigment. We're not looking at what color people's eyes are. Why do we care what color people's skins are? I don't I, get it. I don't so I just, that's the way I have to look at life, and I treat everybody the same. I I love equally. I hate equally. Uh, <laughs> I hate no one. I don't you really hate love people. your I enemies, It too. takes a lot for me to hate people. <laughs> um, but he's telling us we have to wrap up after this quick, quick show. Um, hopefully we'll be back in the studio again I next week. We um, great news that there was no deaths from COVID in New Hampshire yesterday. Yay. Anyways, have a wonderful week. Enjoy the outdoors, and we'll see you next week. Peace Bye. out, guys.